Go ahead and get the org file for today, lecture 15, and open it up, grab the setup, grab that org file and the data file that I've created for class today, but don't uncompress that file. Uh, you can if you really wanted to, but all my instructions, we're going to leave it compressed and just load the data right out of the compressed file. Usually what that means is there might be two Emacs windows open and you may have tweaked the other one. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mm -hmm. look like that's the case. I would do a control G and the easiest way to go back to the original is, mm -hmm. is do meta x revert buffer and that'll get reread it off of the disk. Yeah. So it's possible. Like yep. This? yep. Press enter. I, yes. Or Collapsed it. It's been doing that lately. For some reason, it's been doing that automatically. It's been collapsing it. Yeah, so if you go up to the top line of your file, see how you have a three in front of your startup? Yeah, where'd that come from? Uh, you probably bumped it. Oh. Uh, so Control D. Control D. Yep. Now save it and then revert the buffer, and it won't. It'll be all expanded. If you want to collapse it, now you have to do a Shift Tab to collapse. Oh, and it'll let me do that. So today, it's time to stop being boring with just text. We're going to plot stuff today. So I hope you guys are ready. And I tried to make it easier so that uh, you don't have to worry about right now what we did last time. So we're, when you download this bzip file that's right here, that file has got the data that's been parsed, which was taking it from the really crazy NEMA format and turning it into something a lot simpler. So we're going to work through that, plot up the data, take a look at what our GPS is doing on the roof, and decide whether or not we think the GPS is doing a good job. Hopefully you've got a directory like this with the org file, if you want it there, and the bzip2 file. We don't need to uncompress it because the tools we're going to use in Python today can actually read bzip compressed files. The nice thing about that is that if you have a ton of text data, it can get very big quickly. Anyone who's logged, uh, say, multi-beam data that's in a text format will know that it likes to fill up your disk as fast as possible. So leaving it compressed is a good thing. So we can do uh, bzcat and then our file and pipe that to head like we've done many times at this point. And we should see the first lines of our data file. And I'm hoping this got, looks to you guys a lot friendlier than the format we had last time. So we should see a uh, first line that's a comment line with a pound at the beginning. And then I have put in the column names so that we can remember them without having to magically know what they are. So we've got in here our longitude and latitude. Now be warned, I tend to do things in X, Y, Z. And a lot of people will do Y, X, Z, which to me seems very strange because that's not a right-handed coordinate frame. So I try to stick with a right-handed coordinate frame, X, Y, Z, and stay away from lat, lat long. I try to do long lat. If you see me going backwards and getting screwed up, please shout out because it happens. So this is our data set for today. And we can also do a quick word count, see how much data we have. We have 86,000 points. So I'd like you to read through all and double check and make sure they're good, please. Uh, this is when graphing is important because we're never going to look at all those points. There's no, there's no way. So let's go ahead and start up Python with IPython as our shell with PyLab. And if you forget PyLab, it's going to be really unfun today because we are definitely doing lots of plotting. So I started IPython. We're going to work with a very handy command called load txt. This is a part of a package called numpy that's brought in by PyLab. And load text is a very handy tool that knows how to read in a large number of text formats. If we hit enter here and get some help, it'll give us some description. It'll typically assume that everything is a floating point number, which should work for us OK today. It knows that if a line starts with a pound, it's a comment. That's pretty cool for us. Delimiter, none. Uh, it'll say down below that if we don't tell it a delimiter, it assumes that some sort of white space is between each of our columns. 
Uh, we could also tell it explicitly we want a comma if we did, but here we just have white space. We're also going to try out in a minute this unpack feature down here. So we can take a look through those. We're going to give it a file name. And if we notice in the description here, it says if the file name extension is .gz or .bz2, it knows to first uncompress that file on the fly. So that's our handy way to get to keep it compressed. We're not going to worry about data type. And we're going to come back and look at unpack in a minute to be able to pull apart the data. If your data is nicely formatted as a text file, load text is a great way to get your data in so that you can work with it. So if you didn't type that, which is on the screen, load text will not appear if you don't have a PyLab. Q. Yep, I even put it in the class notes here for you because I figured that somebody would probably not remember the Q. Run from the bash prompt, you want to run um, ipython dash dash pylab. Mm -hmm. In your case now, if you do a load text question mark, see what happens. So now, let's go ahead and try out the sample of loading data that we have here. So we'll do data equals, and if you don't do the equal sign, it's going to dump a giant amount, in fact, 86,000 lines of text on your screen that you don't really want. So load txt, so we're gonna call this function. Remember that we can use tabs to complete file names. So it'll complete out, and then we'll end the parentheses on the right. And if you hit enter, it should take less than a second to load data in. And you can then type the word type and parentheses and data, and it will tell us what it did. This is a special data type. There's a whole library called NumPy designed for high performance numerical analysis. We can run Fourier transforms on this stuff. We've got all kinds of really cool features and it's designed to be compact and fast. All you need to know is that it's convenient and it works. So if we type just data to see what happens, to see what's in there. The nice thing about this is when you're in IPython, it's not gonna, if you just do a nice enter like this, it will actually try to give you a fairly friendly version of it. And what we've got here is arrays that represent, it's a basically a list of arrays, and each one of those entries in there is gonna be one of our records. So let's go ahead and type data sub zero and get one of them back and see what it looks like. And what we get back is, if we look at our columns, so we have X, Y, Z quality satellites and HDOP is your horizontal dilution of precision, which if you haven't taken a class about that, you will soon. That comes back in one record. Unfortunately, we really want all of our X's in one big array so we can plot X against Y and things like that. So this isn't really a convenient form for us to have the data. It's really kind of, well, it's not kind of, it's very annoying. So what we're gonna do is use that unpack feature to pull apart the data types that are in there. And the way we do that is we give it a name for each of the fields. So we've got, if we say length of, of one of those records, we have six different fields that we've gotta give names to, and they're gonna come in the order of our columns. So we're gonna say column X, Y, and Z and then we get quality, satellites, HDOP, load TXT, and ignoring the notes when we have the NP dot, that's not right for right now. This is what we had before, that's not gonna work. We're gonna add a, a new option in there, so there's gonna be a comma, and we're gonna say unpack equals true. So this tells it to go off and pull apart each of those columns from our data and fill them out as columns as opposed to giving them to us as rows. Do you see how you have an extra equal sign up there? So you did data equals L load text. You have just overwritten the load text function. You've reassigned load text to be that string. So I would suggest that you quit out of IPython and restart IPython because you've wiped out load text. In Python, you can assign anything to a function and it will then replace that function. So you've lost load text in that. So go ahead and quit out of IPython and restart it. So go ahead and hit enter with this and hopefully it works for all of you.
but I had to append the BZ to. Do an LS, so you've got it there. So do you, in the notes, I have an extra NP dot. That that's a typo. Oh. I didn't mean to. That's in. That's meant to come in later in the class. Oh, okay. So, so go back up and remove the NP dot because that's incorrect, yeah. and then it should work. Yeah. Sorry about that. Then it should just go. So that tab reads the files that are in the directory that you're. Yeah, the tabs are usually pretty smart. It tries to look around and realize, okay, I'm in, I'm probably working with the file name, mm -hmm. so I'm going to give you the file name if that's the only thing I can match it with. Now that we have our data loaded in as nice separate variables, we can take a peek at what they look like. Go ahead and type x and just see what happens. And what we have here is an array for our longitude. We've got all of our longitudes coming back from the GPS in series. We can do the same with y, and you'll see our latitudes coming back. There's some really nice functions built in. We can say average, and you can AVE and then tab. And then if you say x, it's going to average everything in that array and give you back the average value for the position for our GPS, which is perfect for this one because we know the GPS isn't moving unless someone is dragging our building away. It's so it's just sitting up there on the roof. Our best estimate is taking all of that data and averaging it is our best estimate for the location of our GPS. You can do the same for Y. If you plot those two up on a map, you should put a little mark right on the top of our building. Now you can also do fun things like you can say min of X and get the minimum back. If you forget what min is, you can always do a question mark on it, and it'll tell you a little bit about it. It might be a little confusing to some of you. Can I delay uh, all the variables data? If you do percent who, you can say delete any one of those variables that you want to get rid of. So you're always welcome to do that. But there, right now, there's no reason to delete anything that we've got, because we may use it. What's that? Data. Your old data? Oh, yeah, if you want to delete that, you're welcome to, to do that. How do you know it kept them all in the right order? Is there a way to check that, or you just go? That's what we just did with the uh, just typing X, and you see them coming in in order. You could also take a couple numbers and take a peek. Okay. Yeah. If you did like a head, you can take a look at the first couple and see if they're coming out right. Mm -hmm. Let's just get a plot up of our X value. This is going to give us our first peek into how a GPS is doing. So this is the plot of the longitude of our GPS. Now I all expect you to know exactly how big a thousandth of a lo longitude degree is here, right? Mm -hmm. No, that's, I mean it's a completely useless number for us. So we're going to in a bit look at how to convert that the motion of the x and y into a meter from our average. But this gives you a general sense that it's pretty stable, you know, compared to something from the 1950s if you were doing a satellite fix in the early 60s from one of the first sat-nav systems, it would be moving quite a bit more. So it's showing it's probably pretty good. You can plot the y variable. So that's going to be our latitude. We get something that we don't want. It's trying to plot both the x and the y as two separate lines on the same graph, which means that the variation in each of those is pretty much not what we want. There's a couple ways that you can deal with that. The first one is you can always say CLA, which clears out your graph. And I don't actually know what CLA stands for. I can ask it, clear the current axes. And then you can replot Y just by itself. And then if you want to go back to X, you could replot. You could do a clear and then plot X. Yeah, yeah. It's basically sort of interactive. I haven't totally figured out interactive mode versus. Give me some time to, to read up on that. So I'm showing you, I'm trying to teach you guys the way I wish I had been taught to plot. Because I learned to plot with GNU plot. And I spent 15 years with GNU plot and it drives me insane. It's not very flexible, it's really grumpy, and it doesn't like to do things like polar plots and other stuff that I need to do very well. And Matplotlib is way more powerful, but that means I also don't know it as well as I know GNU plot. So I'm still trying to figure out all the little corners of Matplotlib. But the nice thing is we can tell it to switch between figures. And the other good thing to go with this is anything you learn with this, if you go over to MATLAB, the plotting in MATLAB 
uh, this is trying to mimic how MATLAB does its plotting. Plotting in MATLAB is really awesome. And so they copied what they thought was a great design. It works really well in Python. The key thing we can do is we can say figure two, and you can have any number of numbered figures, and it's going to plot, plop up on the screen a second window that I have no space to really put somewhere. You can switch back and forth between these, so we could plot x in this figure two and y in figure one. So then you can start, if you've got a screen that's big enough to see what's going on, you can start plotting up all of your different graphs and look at them next to each other. But really what we want to do is probably more like something like this. So we'll do a CLA to clear, and we really want to be doing plot x comma y. So what this is going to do is plot the x values against the y values rather than plotting our latitude and longitude separately. We get an ink blot test. So this is our GPS, the position of it over an entire day. If that's not too many meters, then that's probably a pretty good thing. But you can see that it's pretty random and it's, it's uh, centered on an area without any bias much one way or the other. We have one little spike sticking up the top. In general, it's a fairly nice tight ball of stuff. It's not heading off too, too far. And we'll have to later on see how many meters that is. And this is a lot better plot than our, than our X and Y separately. But sometimes you just want to plot a particular part of that. Uh, I think it's once a second. Some, uh, 86,000. Yeah, it's about once a second. I don't know if it's tightly controlled to once a second or if it's just going as fast as it can. That's great, but when you start having multiple figures, it's kind of important to be able to label things. And if you want to print them out and do something in your notebook, if you don't have labels on things, it's going to get bad fast. So let's go learn how to put some labels on. The first thing we can do is add a title. So you do title, parentheses, and then the string inside that you want. And we'll call it GPS Wander for one day. If you are actually doing this for your notebook, I would put your, the date that this was for and a few, mo few more things on here so that you actually could figure out which day of data you were plotting. All right, let's label our X and Y axes. So we can say X label. You could say longitude. And nicely, longitude appears right up here. We can say Y label, latitude, put the latitude over on the left. It works pretty well. Before I go any farther, let me give you a sense of how powerful this is and how little I know of Matplotlib. So you can go way beyond my skills. There's a link up at the top. There's a gallery on Matplotlib's website. And when you're bored and you want to see pretty pictures, and if you like graphs, here are some of the sample graphs that they were able to do. They're even able to draw a heart. They've got polar plots. They've got some little triangle shaped thing. They've got flow through some sort of system. These are all graphs made with Matplotlib, and they give you the sample script on how to make each one of those. If you like if you're a biologist, biologists tend to like to do whisker plots. You can do whisker plots. Uh, you can do things that are 2D images. You can do all kinds of stuff. You can draw crazy pictures. You can do bar charts. And there's a picture of a, of a person. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff with this. So this tool, the more you learn with it, the more you'll be able to pull off some of these cool graphs that I don't yet know how to do myself. Do you export these? You can turn them into SVGs, scalable vector graphics that, that work in Illustrator. You can make images, so PNGs and GIFs, things like that. It's pretty flexible in terms of what it will output. So if you're trying to make a figure for your poster, this is a great tool for being able to uh, really create some cool graphics. So let's do a little bit more to make this more useful. We can add, once you've got a plot up, you can add other plots on top of it. Let's plot the average of the x and y, so sort of the center point that this uh, is wandering around. So we can say plot, and we can say average x, comma, average y. And then it has some special text strings, and I only remember a couple of them off the top of my head. But we can say r inside there for red, and o for a circle. So the default is uh, start off with a blue line to connect all the points. If we just want to do 
a red circle. We now have a little tiny red circle in the middle at the center point of that mess of uh, points. And we can do something like, we can throw a label on it. And we can throw labels at particular locations. So we can say, annotate center. So we're going to write the center text there. And then we say it's going to be at xy of average x, comma, average y. And uh, getting your, the right number of parentheses is sometimes hard. So there needs to be three parentheses on the right. I missed one, it came back down to the other side. There's nothing right there at the moment. So if it hasn't drawn that particular part of the graph, you can say show, and it will try to draw everything. And if I do this right, there's now a center that on the projector you really can't see. But on your screen, you can hopefully see a little black center written on there. If you look up in the notes, it's got all kinds of things where you can change the font, you can make it bold, you can switch the color, pick a color that you can actually see. How can you change which figure you're operating on? If we wanted to go to figure two, Just whatever we're now on figure two, so we're on that other one that's back here. It's got a lot of state, so we're going to see some more of that. We're going to build some subplots where we do one figure with multiple plots together. And you have to remember which part you're on. So you tell it, okay, now I'm working on this subplot. And there's probably a way to ask it, but typically that's kind of confusing and hard to find. So if, as long as you keep telling it where you're at, then you're good. So let's get fancy now and let's do some actual geospatial work. So we're going to go ahead and try to use a library called Proj, P-R-O-J, that was originally written at the USGS in, uh, I believe, the 70s. And it started off in Fortran and it was kind of scary, but it's been improved over the years and turned into a really amazing projection library. So it knows all about ellipsoids, projections, and can transform data between all sorts of different coordinate frames for you. We're going to use that. It actually knows about distances on the ellipsoids, and so it can calculate great circle distance between two points so that you don't have to do it because... That's updated then, whenever what? there's an update? There's updates fairly often as people add new projections, and it's got several, like maybe 10, 20,000 <laughs> projections in there. So if you get stuck, Control-C is your your bailout in IPython. So let's give Proj a try and let's see if we can project some data, or not project it, but at least get ourselves a, a distance. So we're going to use a library called PyProj that's a wrapper around some C code. So import PyProj. You don't need to really know what's in there other than it works. You have to create an object that knows which ellipsoid it's working with. So we're going to say G-E-O-D, and I don't really know what that stands for. And we'll go into the PyProj module, and we'll use their G-E-O-D. And in fact, before I do that, we're going to ask it for help. And you can see that is not terribly helpful. So PyProj.geod, or geode, with a capital G. Press Enter, and it will tell you a little bit about that it does forward and inverse geodetic or great circle computations. And then it gives you not enough information to really figure out what it's going to do. I'll guide you through the actual process of setting it up. So, so if you see right, so here I was just typing tab. It gave me this list of three things that were possible and then I had to finish it out. Yeah, you're, yep, that was me hitting tab. So if you noticed on the screen up there, it said 34 and then it said 34 again. That means I didn't hit enter. So you tried to run a command that wasn't going to work. That's not, yeah, so I'm working on a new command 35. So start with 35, my 35. So I know this is gonna keep tripping you guys up for the rest of the semester, but I can't even stop myself at this point. I hit tab all the time. And so you're gonna see partial completions come along. So you gotta keep an eye on so here it's number 34, and here it's again 34. That means I haven't hit enter. So you're looking at a partial command that if you press enter after typing in this text, you're going to get some sort of strange error. It'll probably say, I don't know what pi is. So I apologize, but you're going to see it again and again. So hopefully you guys will start catching that more often. If, I figure if I abuse you guys enough times, right, you'll, you'll figure it out, I hope. 
So let's get this thing settled, and we need to tell it which ellipsoid, and I currently don't remember how to ask it all the ellipsoids. Ellipse equals WGS84. So if you know anything about ellipsoids, this is the one that's used for GPS systems. You're hopefully going to learn a ton about geodesy, but you're not going to learn it from me. So we're going to do more of the mechanics, and I'll leave the theory to probably Sema, who will be talking to you about ellipsoids and geodesy and all that. Here we're just going to get it done, and then you can go ask him the details of the math. So if we run that command, that's going to give us this geod, or geod, I don't even know how to say this, object. We can put a period after it, and you can hit tab to find out what it's got available. Like I was telling you before, ignore all the things with underscores and go look over on the right. And it has two things in here that we care about, forward and inverse. That's whether you're going from a point and a distance and direction, or if you're going from two points and you want to figure out the distance and direction between the two. We're going to use the inverse, which takes two points and gives us back direction and distance between those two points. So let's give it a shot. So we'll say inverse. We can pick two points. So I'm going to take x1, y1, and I'm going to take a gamble. I'm going to take x minus 1 and y minus 1. So that's the very last point. If you guys remember the array stuff that we've done, minus 1 is the very last one. So actually, this isn't the first one. That would be 0. I'll do the actual first one. Zero is the first one, so we'll do first and last. This is going to be the distance and direction between the first point that was taken during that day and the last point. So we're going to hit enter and cross our fingers. What you're going to get back, we're going to have to ask it question mark on the inverse call. And it's going to tell us, hopefully, returns the forward and back azimuth, which is the direction in degrees, and then the distance. So we have, this is going to be the direction from the first point to the last point. This is the opposite direction from the last point to the first point. And then this is how far apart they are. And I believe it's in meters. Does it actually tell us that here? I know it's in meters, but oh yes, distances are in meters. In one day, this GPS has drifted 5.2 meters from that starting point to the ending point which doesn't seem too bad. I mean, it's not great, but... It doesn't mean that's the greatest wander either, right? That's no, that's just yep. during those points, and it might have wandered back closer, so there's probably a distance that's wandered greater than that. So we've at least now been able to calculate a distance, and we know our GPS is roughly okay if, we, if a distance of five meters isn't too terrible for us. If you're trying to do the equivalent of RTK, the real-time kinematics GPS for surveying, and you want sub-centimeter, we look like we have a problem. So we can't quite use this GPS for fancy stuff like that. So let's go ahead and try to use this to create a function that we can go across all of our data and calculate the distance from the average and the direction from the average for every single point for our data set. So this is going to be going back to learning how to write functions and creating something that can actually handle how to do that. So let's go ahead and create something and we'll call it wander.py for calculating wander. So we're going to need our pyproj library again so we need to import that into this file. Import pyproj so we can do the, the geode. And we're going to need to create a function wander list so it's going to create a list of the wanders, how far it's deviated from our average point. So this is creating a function, if you remember. Def says, I want to create a function. And then here we've given it our, the name of our function, so wander list. Two parentheses will be our arguments, what we're going to pass in. Right now we're passing nothing in. Colon says we're going to go ahead and start it. Inside there. We can certainly do that. We don't, we don't have to have it here. It's, I tend to do it just because it's great, because then you can run it from the bash shell later on, too. Uh, so the, okay. I, it's I not required. 
it tends to be a good thing to do, so I'll go ahead and do it. If we didn't do it, we would be okay for now, and we might later on find out that we had some trouble. So let's go ahead and start working on this function. We need to bring back in what we did with the geo D. I gotta learn how to pronounce this somehow or pick some way. So history, we'll see what we've been doing. So here is our import that we did. Then we need to create one of these objects that we're gonna use to do the transformation. So edit copy and paste this in here. Then we're gonna wanna load in all of that data that we did before. Way back here, for me, this was number seven. We loaded in the data. So edit copy, paste that in. So we load the data inside of our function. Now this isn't a great function because typically you're gonna to wanna to write functions you can reuse later on. And having a hard coded file name is kind of bad, but we're gonna be lazy for now until it works. Because worrying about too many things at once will kind of drive you nuts. Okay, so now we want to have our averages that we can use as we loop through all of the points. So let's compute our averages. So x av equals average of x and y av equals average of y. Now I'm doing this once at the beginning rather than each time we're in the loop. We could calculate the average on the fly but that's an expensive thing to do because to calculate an average, it has to read the entire array and then run some math on that and compute a number. So we want to have things like averages pre-computed if you can. And there's going to be a big problem here. If we come over here and we say help average, this function came in with our PyLab. And while I think the dash dash PyLab is pretty cool, it hides things. And typically you'll find Python programmers always like to be explicit, saying where the, the modules come from, which bit of code gives you a particular function. And doing these massive imports where you just take an entire project and pull it into your uh, working space means that you have no idea where average came from. And I'm gonna have to tell you that average comes from something called NumPy. So we've gotta go get NumPy and find average. You know, things like plot and average aren't a part of the normal Python shell, so we have to bring them back in if we want to use them. So we'll have to do import numpy. And if we use something a lot, we can make an alias for it so it comes in as a different name. So we can say as np. Now, normally I wouldn't try to teach you guys something like this, but everybody does it. So if you read someone else's code, you're going to see np dot all over and you've already seen it stuck in my notes accidentally I have better show you the import as so what you can do here is you're basically creating a new name for it so we could say import pyproj is something else too if we wanted we could say as some really annoying name and we could then refer to it as some really annoying name we really don't want to do that but this is one that everybody seems to do so we're just going to stick with it so we then need to say np.average, np.average. And if you want to see that, we'll try it over here in the IPython terminal. We'll say import nump or numpy as np. And then you can say mp period and then the tab key and you'll see all the things that come in with numpy. So it's got lots of fun stuff in there that you can go read through at your leisure, but it actually has average is in there. I apologize, this is a little more confusing than I would like it to be, but I'm trying to follow the conventions that people tend to use. So in our function now, it should hopefully compute the average x and y. So why don't we go ahead and try it? We'll say print x av comma y av, and then remember to save so control X, control S. There should be no stars down here at the bottom. So if we do LS, we'll see that we have a wander.py in there. And I'm gonna cross my fingers and we'll say run wander. And we're gonna hope it works, hit enter. Guess what, it did nothing. Does anyone have an idea why running this script printed absolutely nothing? And why didn't it load anything? Print is within the function. Exactly, and we never call the function. 
Let's not run it. We'll do, instead we'll do import wander like we did last time. And then we'll say wander a period. We'll hit tab and we'll see that there's actually wander list down here. So wander list and two parentheses. So we're going to run that function within inside of our wander module. Press enter and we're going to find our first set of bugs that we didn't know about. Load text also comes from NumPy and I missed an NP dot there. Hopefully I don't miss any more of them. So now if we did import it's not going to work. So import only works the first time and then it's the word is cached. It's loaded in and the operating system tries to be careful about keeping it around so it doesn't try to work harder than it has to. So if we do this and we run it, it's exactly the same bug. We have to do a reload of Wander. So there we've reloaded it and now if we go back up and run it, yay, we get our average, our X and our Y. Remember when you guys type this stuff in, Python cares very much about your indentation. So if your def for a function is not on the left-hand side of the screen, you're going to have problems. So if you have any extra spaces in here, like say something like that, it's not going to work. So you want to be all the way up against the left-hand column. And remember to use the tab key to indent. So if I press tab here, the indentation's good. If it's all wonky, I can hit tab and it will take me right back to the right indentation. Let Emacs do the work for you for indentation. It's not fun to try and count spaces. And if you import it, so you've imported it, so now you need to do a reload. Yeah, once you've imported, you have to do a reload from there on out. Uh, you're going to call the function, so you need to have parentheses after it. Yep, so you can also put the cursor, I know this is, this is actually an English word, so click on that. You could do meta x i spell meta dollar and see how it's saying that this, the word's misspelled so press a zero and it will give you average so press zero spelling yep you had a spelling error no so that just reloaded the module so now you need to do wander dot wander list parentheses see how the file name is actually different you need to have this file name in here so i have i had been working with a different file and so I have a, the wrong file name in here. So you need to change that to be the right file name. Oh, I'll find that. Mm -hmm. So see how it's got the gga.dat.bz2? We don't have that in there, so you need to make those match. Without the parentheses, mm -hmm. you're just actually referencing the function. So you actually want to call the function. You have to put parentheses to call the function. Oh, I didn't notice it didn't have parentheses. Yeah, it takes a while <laughs> to get used to this kinds of like, when do I run? When do I have parentheses? And I think a lot of it is just, Keep watching, and every time we do it, just try to think to yourself, which one do we do and why? And hopefully it'll start becoming a little more familiar. And your eye will start picking up those things after a while. And on Tuesday, we're going to keep going through this. I will do this all up as a video. So if you want to watch the video before the next class, that would be great. Then we can go through it and make sure everybody's up to speed on plotting because you're going to be doing it for all of your data. So being able to plot is super important for general research. So we'll try and get you all the really comfortable with it.